on World News Tonight. Russia Gate revived. The tables turn in favor of Trump as new details reveal Hillary Clinton's connection to Russia, the link between the spyware and the 2016 campaign leading to flurries of new accusations. Tonight, the details on the election scandal. Awaiting fire. New information confirms the completion of Russia's assembly of forces at the Ukrainian border. However, there still may be hope for a diplomatic de-escalation of the situation. Will Russia make the move? Find out tonight. Trudeau takes action. Emergency powers of Canadian Prime Minister have been officially activated in an attempt to quell the eruptions of protests nationwide, causing major blockages in the country, slowing down its economy. Despite this, protesters are raging on, asking for freedom over all else. And spectacular synchrony. Marking the day of the rising sun, swimmers put on a splendid display of synchronized swimming to commemorate the birth anniversary of the nation's late leader. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with a look at a filing from Special Counsel John Durham which found lawyers for the Clinton campaign paid a technology company to infiltrate servers belonging to Trump Tower and later the White House in order to establish an inference and narrative to bring to government agencies linking Donald Trump to Russia. Durham filed a motion on February 11th focused on potential conflicts of interest related to the representation of former Clinton campaign lawyer Michael Sussman, who has been charged with making a false statement to a federal agent. Sussman has pleaded not guilty. The indictment against Sussman says he told then FBI General Counsel James Baker in September 2016, less than two months before the 2016 presidential election, that he was not doing work for any client when he requested and held a meeting in which he presented purported data and white papers that allegedly demonstrated a covert communications channel between the Trump Organization and Alpha Bank, which has ties to the Kremlin. But Durham's filing reveals that Sussman has assembled and conveyed the allegations to the FBI on behalf of at least two specific clients, including a technology executive at a U.S.-based internet company and the Clinton campaign. Former President Trump reacted to the filing, saying Durham's filing provides indisputable evidence that his campaign and presidency were spied on by operatives paid by the Hillary Clinton campaign in an effort to develop a completely fabricated connection to Russia. Former chief investigator of the Trump-Russia probe for the House Intelligence Committee, Kash Patel, said the filing definitively shows that the Hillary Clinton campaign directly funded and ordered its lawyers to orchestrate a criminal enterprise to fabricate a connection between President Trump and Russia. Over to the Ukraine border tensions now, Washington reaffirmed its warning that Russia could invade Ukraine at any moment. And German Chancellor Olaf Scholz prepared to visit both countries in a bid to head off a crisis that Berlin said had reached a critical point. The United States is relocating its Ukraine embassy operations from the capital Kiev to the western city of Lviv, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said on Monday, citing a dramatic acceleration in the buildup of Russian forces. The move comes as U.S. officials warn that Moscow was continuing to amass more than 100,000 troops near Russia's border with Ukraine and in neighboring Belarus and could launch an attack at any time. State Department spokesperson Ned Price said the move is based on Russia's threatening military posture. We are basing our assessment on what we are seeing on the ground with our own eyes, which is a continued and unprovoked Russian buildup on the border with Ukraine and no accompanying evidence of de-escalation. Most embassy staff have already been ordered to depart Ukraine and U.S. citizens have been advised to leave the country by commercial means. Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby on Monday warned that if Russia were to attack Ukraine, there would be casualties on both sides. Should they conduct another major military action, real lives will be at risk. Um, Ukrainian lives, to be sure, but also Russian lives. Um, th this, this will not be bloodless. Moscow denies Western accusations that it is planning an invasion. Russia suggested on Monday that it was ready to keep talking to the West to try to defuse the security crisis. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said diplomatic possibilities are far from exhausted.
Belgian authorities said they had intercepted 30 vehicles as police scrambled to stop a Canada-style protest convoy against COVID regulations from breaching Brussels. The self-proclaimed Freedom Convoy is one of several worldwide inspired by a trucker standoff with authorities in Canada. Barbed wire and barricades outside the European Commission. An unmistakable message to protesters that they're not welcome. Belgian authorities banned a blockade of Brussels and warned against any attempt to bring a Canada-style freedom convoy into the city. Police were channeling vehicles to the outskirts, where only a static protest against coronavirus measures would be permitted. Many protesters had travelled from France, which itself saw a convoy attempt to breach Paris over the weekend. Police largely prevented drivers from accessing the city, though around 100 vehicles did make it onto the city's famed Champs-Élysées with scores arrested. Despite the government pointing to plans to relax mask mandates by the end of the month, and even the hope to halt its vaccine pass by March or April, demonstrators had been inspired by a similar convoy in Canada, one that has brought the country's capital to a standstill for three weeks and had occupied a key border crossing linking Canada and the United States. The Ambassador Bridge handles around a quarter of all trade between the two and was open once more by the end of the weekend, much to authorities' relief. Even so, the anger spawned by two years of coronavirus restrictions remains. Other countries like New Zealand, Australia and the Netherlands have seen similar movements begin to take root. Following the mass protests in Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has been forced to invoke a special emergency power in order to quell the unrest across the country, which arose from unfavorable COVID-19 restrictions and mandates. The Emergencies Act will be used to strengthen and support law enforcement agencies at all levels across the country. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on Monday invoked extraordinary emergency powers in an effort to end protests that have blocked border crossings and paralyzed the country's capital of Ottawa. Here in our capital city, families and small businesses have been enduring illegal obstruction of their neighborhoods. Occupying streets, harassing people, breaking the law, this is not a peaceful protest. The Emergencies Act has only been used once in peacetime by Trudeau's father, former Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, who invoked an earlier version of the act in 1970. It allows the federal government to override the provinces and authorize special temporary measures to ensure security during national emergencies. This is about keeping Canadians safe, protecting people's jobs, and restoring confidence in our institutions. Trudeau's action comes as the so-called Freedom Convoy protests, started by Canadian truck drivers opposing a COVID-19 vaccine mandate, have turned into a rallying point for people opposing the policies of Trudeau's government, covering everything from pandemic restrictions to a carbon tax. Protests in Ottawa have entered their third week, while a six-day blockade on a bridge connecting Windsor, Ontario to Detroit, Michigan, choking the supply chain for U.S. carmakers, was finally cleared over the weekend. Protesters have also shut down smaller border crossings in Alberta, Manitoba and British Columbia. Still, four provincial premiers said they opposed Trudeau's plan to invoke the act, calling it unnecessary, with Quebec's premier adding, quote, now is not the time to throw oil on the fire. The Canadian Parliament would have to approve the use of the emergency measures within seven days, and it also has the power to revoke them. French Foreign Minister jean louis Drian said that all the elements for a major offensive by Russian forces in Ukraine were present and it is possible that an invasion may occur spontaneously. We have other than the World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharma Ratna from Normandy in France for more. Chetana. Yes, Sanradi. Ludrian added that there was nothing to suggest Moscow had yet taken a decision on the situation. However, he emphasized that there is still a possibility for a diplomatic solution. Russia's President Vladimir Putin will also receive the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, the latest Western leader to go to Moscow to seek a diplomatic breakthrough. According to Ludrian, President Vladimir Putin wants to prevent Ukraine from having its sovereignty. However, if the sovereignty of the integrity of Ukraine were challenged by a significant intervention on the part of Russia, 
then there would be a massive consequences, massive sanctions. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shongzhu announced the end of some of Moscow's massive military drills in the Russia and Belarus, but said others were ongoing. Earlier, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov told Putin that there was a chance of reaching an agreement on the security with the West. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was Adi Dernavalny, Special Correspondent Chetan Dharmaratne from Normandy in France. Germany is planning a gradual relaxation of coronavirus measures in the coming weeks, with the relaxation planned in three steps. We have Adi Dernavalny, Special Correspondent in Ponso from Cleve in Germany for more. In yes, Anuradi. The report indicated that face mask requirements are expected to stay in place for the time being. National and state leaders are set to discuss the opening up plan as the country sees a slight decline in the new coronavirus infection rates. Initially, private meetings with more than 10 people would once again become possible. Then, from March 4th, discotheques and clubs would be allowed to reopen. Access to restaurants would also be open to the unvaccinated people if they can show a negative test. Finally, from March 20th, all of the more far-reaching measures would end. Rules that require employers to allow staff to work from home, if possible, would also be lifted from that date. Some more basic restrictions, such as wearing of masks on public transport and in indoor public places, are expected to remain in place. A draft document that federal and state leaders will be asked to approve on Wednesday said most COVID-19 measures would end by March 20th. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent in Ikonoponso from Cleve in Germany. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan visited the United Arab Emirates for the first time in nearly a decade to revive relations that were long strained by regional disputes. It's his first visit to the United Arab Emirates in nearly a decade. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan was greeted by Abu Dhabi's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed on Monday as the two countries rebuild ties in what is a highly symbolic meeting. The dialogue and cooperation between Turkey and the United Arab Emirates is important for the peace and stability of the entire region. We do not see the security and stability of all brotherly countries in the Gulf region as separate from our own. Relations between the two countries have been strained in recent years. Abu Dhabi accused Ankara of supporting political Islam in the Middle East as well as both states backing opposing sides in regional conflicts, from boycotting Qatar to Libya's civil war. But in the midst of an economic collapse, Turkey is now seeking to improve local relations and the UAE is taking a more conciliatory tone in its foreign policy. At the heart of this bilateral meeting is several strategic agreements between the two countries in a range of sectors, including defence, trade, technology and the economy. The UAE's de facto ruler, Prince Mohammed bin Zayed, made the journey to Ankara three months ago, where the Emiratis announced a 9 billion euro Turkish investment fund. After this trip, next on Erdogan's agenda is his upcoming trip to Saudi Arabia. His first visit to the kingdom since the assassination of dissident Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul. Sudanese security forces shot dead two protesters in a crackdown on rallies against last year's military coup and the arrest of scores of pro-democracy activists. The unrest seems to be intensifying as civilians refuse to accept the militia regime. The streets of Khartoum transformed into a battle zone as demonstrators threw stones at police, while security forces responded with tear gas and water cannons. Sudan has faced widespread protests since a military takeover last October, but demonstrations took another dark turn on Monday after at least two protesters were shot dead by police. Medics in the country estimate that at least 80 people have been killed by security forces since the coup, the crackdown has not deterred protesters, but some say they are scared for their lives. Security forces deny opening fire on protesters, but Human Rights Watch says police have been seen shooting live ammunition directly at crowds. 
The coup led by General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan derailed a fragile pile-sharing agreement between the army and civilians. The deal was negotiated after the ouster of the country's longtime ruler, Omar al-Bashir. In his first interview on state television since the military takeover, Burhan condemned the pro-democracy protests. Whoever says this is a coup against legitimacy and democracy are those who lost power. We said it clearly, once political forces unite, we'll be able to hold dialogue with them. And if we agree to hand over power to them, and we've stuck by this until this very day. Several countries have called for the restoration of the civilian-led transition in Sudan. But hundreds of people, including politicians, have been arrested since October's coup. A transition could still be a long way off. Meta is under fire in the U.S. as the Attorney General's Office of Texas has sued the company for illegal data harvesting of countless Texans using facial recognition services. The lawsuit outlines the exposure of this data to other entities as well as not destroying vital information within a reasonable amount of time. The Texas Attorney General's Office sued Facebook parent company Meta on Monday, alleging Facebook violated state privacy protections with facial recognition technology that collected biometric data from millions of Texans without their consent. The lawsuit accuses Facebook of collecting the data from users, photos and videos, disclosing the information to others, and failing to destroy it within a reasonable time. Over 20 million Texans have a Facebook account, the lawsuit said, adding, quote, Facebook repeatedly captured Texans' biometric identifiers without consent, not hundreds or thousands or millions of times, but billions of times. According to a Wall Street Journal report, which cites a person familiar with the matter, the state is seeking hundreds of billions of dollars in civil penalties. Asked about the lawsuit, a Meta spokesperson said the claims were without merit and said Facebook would defend itself vigorously. In a November blog post, the company said it was shutting down a facial recognition system and would delete more than a billion people's information. It cited concerns about the use of the technology and uncertainty over what the rules are regarding its use. It also agreed to pay $650 million in 2020 to settle an Illinois state lawsuit that dealt with similar concerns. Billionaire Jared Isaacman, a member of the first ever civilian astronaut crew to be sent to space, is taking yet another journey to the depths of space with the latest program, Polaris. The new missions also have the same goal of raising funds for charities and hospitals, hopefully topping the last time's record of $240 million. Five months after becoming the first all-civilian commercial astronauts on a multi-day orbit around the Earth. Welcome everybody to Crew Dragon Resilience. Jared Isaacman, the billionaire who paid for that trip and helped raise a massive $240 million for St. Jude Children's Hospital, is going back, paying for another three missions as part of a new SpaceX program dubbed Polaris. The first flight, Polaris Dawn, set to break records late this year. The first commercial astronaut spacewalk 310 miles above the Earth, elevating the St. Jude fundraising efforts and planning to use the new SpaceX satellite network to reach pediatric cancer patients anywhere in the world. Isaacman, an accomplished pilot, will run experiments with three crew members, former fighter pilot Scott Potit, SpaceX engineer Sarah Gillis, and medical officer Anna Menon. And Isaacman has been named the first commander of Elon Musk's Starship, built to one day fly to the moon and eventually Mars. But critics question spending so much money on private space trips. A pledge to expand both commercial space exploration and St. Jude's life-saving mission on Earth. Welcome back to World News tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Novak Djokovic has said he would rather miss out on future tennis trophies than be forced to get a COVID vaccine. He said he should not be associated with the anti-vax movement, but supported an individual's right to choose. European scientists announced fresh progress in the drive to make nuclear fusion a practical, safe and clean energy source, saying an experiment at a site in England set a record for the amount of fusion energy produced, more than doubling the previous mark. 
South Korea's eco-friendly car exports have hit an all-time high for the month of January. Reports show the number of eco-friendly vehicles that the country exported last month rose by about 37% on year. Toshiba said it plans to hold a general meeting of shareholders next month seeking initial approval to break up the 146-year-old conglomerate. The meeting will be an important gauge of shareholder support for the board's restructuring plan. Rivian Automotive's stock jumped after securities filing showed that billionaire investor George Soros bought nearly 20 million shares of the electric truck startup in the last quarter of 2021. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. While most would celebrate with cake and balloons on their birthday, North Korea's late leader Kim Jong-il was gifted something different this year in commemoration. We're leaving you tonight with a look into a beautiful showcase of synchronized swimming titled A Dear Name. Thank you for watching. Good night.